merciful and loving God, you come to us in all our broken relationships and fill us with your most Holy Spirit so that we might find strength, courage, and wisdom to heal those fractures. Help us to see who our neighbor truly is and help us to reach out to the marginalized of our society so that they may be saved from this world and welcomed by Christ's disciples as we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right from the very start of our gospel lesson, in the very first verse, our scripture lesson provides us with a key theme of the parable told by Jesus. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. This one sentence provides the real world perspective seen by Jesus' listeners. Jesus welcomes the marginalized. He welcomes the outcast members of his society at that time. And this is our lesson today. Plain and simple. Jesus' scripture, the message in Jesus' scripture today is an open and affirming education of the first century. It didn't just start with the UCC church, just here in these last 15 years. This was going on back in the first century by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Looking out for the marginalized, looking out for the outcasts, looking out for those who just didn't fit in to our society. And what did the religious authorities of Jesus' day say? They grumbled. They grumbled. This fellow welcomes sinners. Sinners. Oh my God, and he eats with them. Really? How dare he do that? So what do we hear from our religious and secular leaders of our day today about the marginalized and outcast of our society? Well, first of all, we have to name them, don't we? We have to figure out who are the marginalized and outcast of our society. Anybody want to anybody join in? Who are, the, who are the outcasts and marginalized of our society today? What do we see in the news? Anyone? Immigrants. Immigrants. Who else? Homeless. Homeless. LGBT. LGBT. Elderly. Elderly. Victims. Victims. Yeah, victims of crimes. Victims of rape. They're, they're blamed for being raped. Yeah, how about, how about just our minorities? We often hear it say, or heard it, heard it, hear it said, Blacks are blamed for most of the crime in our country today, right? I mean, certainly they're physically filling up our prisons, so they must be responsible. And of course, they're all lazy, right? They're all lazy and all on, all on welfare. I mean, none of their kids have the same father. We've heard this, haven't we? How about Hispanics? Well, they take all of our jobs. They're all here illegally anyway. Or what about Muslims or immigrants? Well, of course, we need to ban them from entering our country because they're all terrorists and, of course, they hate the USA. And the same can be said about the disabled or the LGBT community. I mean, the disabled are just taking advantage of the system. They're getting everything for free. And gays are ruining the institution of marriage. They don't deserve equal rights. And transgender people, oh my God, they're going to attack us in our own bathrooms. <laughs> We've heard all this false rhetoric in the past. And you know what? The unfortunate part about it is it still continues today. We haven't learned. We haven't learned from Jesus Christ who taught this message 2,000 years ago about the marginalized and outcast of his society. We haven't learned about it 2,000 years later. We're still doing it. I mean, isn't that the message we hear from our society today and on the news? I mean, are not minorities and immigrants, disabled, LGBT, even the poor, the marginalized of our society? And even though we here at Trinity are not oppressing them, there are those in our society who do. There may even be some in our church who do. But as a church, as a congregation, we have made that decision, that commitment, not to treat the 
and marginalize the outcast horribly. We give them dignity, we give them respect, and we include them in our, in our family of faith. So the question is, should we remain silent as a church, though? Because all this stuff is going on out We're hearing all this stuff. Should we remain silent? Should we just simply look the other way? Or should we stand up with Christ in our scripture today and support the outcast and the marginalized? But how do we do that? How does that we do that? I mean, do we do that? You see, our scripture lesson today from our risen Savior, from Jesus the Christ, is all about those very same people, those who are marginalized or made to be outcast in his society at the time and ours today. You say, well, we've been through this all before. Well, if we've been through this all before, and we all agree because we, became, we voted to become open and affirming, then why is it still going on? Why is it still happening? So what does Jesus tell us about these people? He said there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You see, those who oppress the marginalized and the outcast are considered sinners by Jesus. By Jesus. And we see this being done by our religious fanatics of our day, but not by Jesus. And therefore, not by us. The parable of the lost sheep is a more compassionate example of how first century Jews treated animals than they did about the Christian society today treats human beings. You see, again, lost doesn't only refer to those who might be lost to God, but it rather also refers to those who are supposed to be lawful and religious and righteous people. Meaning there's a loss of relationship with those like the Pharisees and the religious believers of our day today who know the law of Moses and know the Bible and yet they ignore it and then use it for their own purposes and agendas. How unfair is that? It's a loss of relationship to those who are supposed to accept you. And what has the church done? And we've seen, not this church, but we've seen other churches vote to exclude the LGBT community in their churches. Vote to exclude the immigrants and ban them from our country. Religious organizations, then and now. Religious people, then and now. They're supposed to know that you are to love your neighbor and know who their neighbor truly is. They are to accept the, the alien in your midst as a citizen. Because why? Because once you were foreigners in the land of Egypt, talking to the Israelites. Jesus uses the lost sheep to illustrate that even one lost sheep is important to save. That one relationship, even one relationship is important to save. That means that that's each and every one of us can do it. Because even one relationship can be saved. And it's important. Saving one broken relationship is more important than the 99 strong relationships that you have. So why is this, a, why is, is it a person, a human being, marginalized or outcast, not worthy of their relationship with others? Being saved. Are sinners not worthy? Are the ill or the lame not worthy? Are the poor or those who are different from us? in what they believe, or who they love, or what gender they feel appropriate, not worthy of a relationship with us? This is the question Jesus is asking the Pharisees, and especially us today. When are we going to stop marginalizing and making outcasts of the children of God? When are we going to take time to save or rebuild our relationships with the marginalized and outcast of our society? This is what Jesus is asking of our society today and our world. And today, our society looks at immigrants, Hispanics, LGBT, transgender, blacks, Muslims as outcasts. These are the very, very people Jesus demands that we show love and compassion. The first thing we have to decide is how, or, or, or decide is what is our relationship like with those on the margins? 
Do we need to rebuild our relationship with them? Or are we just a small little church here in Bloomsburg that really has no impact on the marginalized? We don't have a large population of minorities here in Bloomsburg, do we? Except where? At the university. So how might we play a role in building those relationships? I mean, we are involved in Protestant campus ministries at the university. I'm a board member on PCM. And we have invited them here. We used to have the PCM uh, kids from the university come here on a regular basis. We're involved in the Coalition for Social Equity. I'm on the steering committee. And in fact, two of, our, two of the work groups for social equity actually meet here in our church. The interfaith work group and the racial equity work group. But as a church, as a church, do we build relationships with the African-American students, the Hispanic students, or those who need financial help? No. Not really. I mean, we're good. We're, we've got a good start by being part of organizations that support minorities, but we even do a good job supporting the poor with our missions. But what do we as a church need to, get, need to do to get to know these people? Our crop pop ministries do a wonderful job getting to know some really good people. Could we invite minority students, university students here for a get to know you meal? Could we conduct a fundraiser that would help buy books or supplies for some of these students? Could we invite other marginalized groups to meet here to start conversations? Dawn and I had a very good friend of ours who was Muslim. And he used to come to my church. And we looked at him and kind of scratched our head, like, why are you coming to a Christian church when you're Muslim? And he said, because, he goes, we're all talking about the same God. There's just different pathways. He goes, and I learned things from you. He goes, the Quran talks about Jesus. And it does. And Muhammad would come to our church to hear not only Go, not only go to mosque and hear go for prayer, but come to the church and hear us. And in fact, I even went and provided pastoral care for his father when he had emerging appendicitis when he traveled for, to hear from Pakistan. Now, his father had no idea what I was saying, and I had no idea what he was saying. But it didn't matter. I was there praying for him, and he knew it. So why don't we go to great lengths to bring the marginalized outcast back, an outcast back into relationship with us and our society? I mean, the message is very clear to us today. We need to call our friends and our neighbors together so that we can rejoice that even one marginalized or outcast person is brought back into relationship with their neighbors. Because there will be more joy in heaven than the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents, over one broken relationship that is Mended. Let believers across the globe be those sinners that repent or turn around from their ways today and heal those broken relationships. So that as the UCC motto says, so that we all may be one.